As creative ambassador at large for Barney's, my job has always been to um, find ways to communicate the trends that the merchants, the buyers, the buying team, the fashion director, um, the CEO of our company, the head merchants, they decide which ideas and concepts we're going to go after. Uh, my name is Connie Wang. I'm the style director of Refinery29, and my job is to make sure that, you know, everything on the site that touches style, which is basically absolutely everything at this point, um, you know, is our brand, our voice, our tone, our vision, our aesthetic. So Refinery29 is an interesting name because at the very beginning, at the very core of it means to refine what's out there. Um, and to refine, you know, all of that information to make what, to, to what makes sense for yourself, um, and what makes sense for your life and your your sensibilities and your personal style. You know, we don't just talk about what happens on the runway during fashion week. We talk about what specific trends there are and how you can actually wear them. Don't be sensitive about client is any company related to the fashion style and design industry. Uh, from huge retailers like Inditex. Uh, uh, Inditex is the company that owns Sara. Maybe also manufacturers, uh, textile manufacturers, uh, leather manufacturers. So basically all the companies that had to be prepared uh, for future seasons, that had to work ahead of time to define what they're going to offer to their clients. The opening ceremony began really from a trip that Umberto and I took to Hong Kong. Our approach has been, this is what we're interested in, and let's push ourselves to feel slightly uncomfortable because we know in six, eight months when this comes out, who knows what's going to be happening. And so we're always pushing ourselves in a way that I think, you know, moves us forward. So as while they are a huge focus, it is just part of it because a lot of it is about, you know, people you're talking to and you know we had pronouns at our show and you know all these things that I think are part of our cultural landscape that we are just interested in and so I think we like to include all of that and so hopefully it comes across. Uh, the house of Saba is born because I was on Canal Street and I saw a lot of people and a lot of jewels and I've always had jewels. I came to New York with my gold tooth. I had to have a gold tooth to come to New York and so the thing is uh, I saw all these beautiful people. They were fantastic to look at, the New Yorker, and the style, and the groove, and the bikes, and the idea as well to put street culture and to enjoy who you are and give it the chic and the class. Through amazing artists like Tupac before or, or Notorious B.I.G. and Lil Kim that I have adored, I, I have worked with her one day. And I, uh, and I was mesmerized by my encounter with uh, Lil' Kid. There was actually a pair of shoes that really inspired the book, which was uh, this pair of $7 canvas flats that I bought from Kmart, and I write about it in the introduction to the book. And because they were marked down to $7 a piece, I just cleared the store out of my size. I bought all of the shoes in my size, so I bought 7 seven pairs of these seven dollar shoes so i asked myself if i'm shopping this way there's got to be a lot of other people out there shopping this way and what i found was that i i am essentially the typical american consumer i shop cheap and i buy in quantity and i wanted to look at the mechanisms behind why that is i think the term trend has become increasingly difficult to define It's like a will-o'-the-wisp. It's very hard to nail it down, especially now that the fashion universe is 50 billion times larger than it ever was in the past. I think trends have a really specific definition. It's what happens when uh, a fashion style gains some sort of popular appeal and it has to trickle down into the mass market and it has to be adopted by the wider public. Trend is an interesting word because in some senses it shouldn't exist if if designers have access unlimited access to all the resources and touch points and you know things out there like the fact that multiple ones will do the same thing um, in one season is kind of mind-boggling right um, but I think about trends in that not, not not the micro trends that happen from season to season but if you look look at trends across a decade it's just a complete manifestation of like 
what's happening socially, what's happening politically, what's happening, you know, in pop culture. It's um, you can literally see it manifest itself through clothes. To define the word trend is twofold. I think, you know, trend is, you know, obviously seeing what's happening and what people are embracing on the street and how it's being celebrated. I think, you know, is it a conversation that we're doing with a friend whose movie's coming out or is it an artist who's having a big exhibition? And I think when we see trends and things happening, you know, we think it's exciting and, and we're part of it and, and we as consumers really are active. Trend is a term that actually is a scientific term. It's used either in the financial world or in the fashion world and it's something that points out a direction. It's something that tells you in which direction a uh, term, a concept, an item is going, either going up, either going down. Are we talking about stock going up, going down? Are we talking about motorcycle jackets going up, going down uh, in the popularity of the market? So. The fact that trend is now a verb, trending, um, like something can be trending, it's like it's, it's really funny um, to think about because it, it really has to do with the immediacy of our content. Um, so Twitter started that trending hashtag section and now it's, I feel like it's in like the Merriam-Webster or something like that. It's like a real, real word now. Something like hippie was very, very much tied in to the culture in the broadest, broadest sense, as was punk because England was going through this dire economic period. People had to make clothes out of trash bags. They were angry, safety pins. It meant something. Obviously, there are a lot of people out there that are in the public eye that are, have amazing style and fashion. But I think what's interesting for Umberto and I is really looking when we travel to see what youth culture is wearing. They're coming up, it's not necessarily they're working where they're getting to buy all the things that they want, but they piece things together in a way that I think can be really inspiring for us. We look for emerging trends um, in a variety of places, but the internet, personal style blogs, um, Instagram is huge because you take your outfit of the day photos and everyone sees it. Tumblr, through Twitter, through through random like 14 year old blogs um, across the internet, like they, they're really the ones who are coming at fashion with fresh eyes and a fresh perspective and a new way of thinking. I mean, like with this whole sea punk thing that happened in like, you know, the, the warehouses in Bushwick where people who aren't really in the fashion industry at all and then fashion like kind of co-opted and then you see it popping up on the runway everywhere. When I arrived in 1995, 96, yeah. that photographed everybody that was in camouflage. And there was one guy very influential. He's called EZQ. I give him credit for that. And he was the one guy that filmed everybody of hip hop in Brooklyn. And I buy myself the same day 10 squares of camouflage. Mm -hmm. But what the hip hop has done and the rock and roll style has influenced much more. So the, the designers like Carl Lagerfeld or all of them, they use the style. And they are coming from people that are artists and not so much people that concept commercially, which is good because we need this, but we need to acknowledge where it comes from. People from the outskirts of the cities wanted for one time show that they want to be themselves and not imitate the others. In fashion shows for the high end market, we can see many trends, we can see many ideas, many colors. But what makes them successful is identifying those that are going to be key, those that are going to have much more impact in the market. And that's the work we do at WGSN. We've had a panel of experts here at WGSN. They gather every season, they see uh, what's happening from street style to trade shows to fashion shows to uh, other, uh, to in art, what's going on in art, in design. There was a time when trends were quite easy to identify. Um, for example, Vivian Westwood, trend after trend after trend, from punk onwards, Mucha Prada, trend after trend after trend. She coughed them up in the 90s, one after another, and they were very much copied, all her ideas. Donna Karen, many trends she's created because she knew what women wanted. She was operating from that personal point of view. So there's certain people that really, wow, they had so many important ideas. They recognized when the time was right and they got it together and they produced it and it hit the consumer, um, you know, in their sweet spot, wherever that is. 
Transportcasting is a strategic system for the fashion industry to foresee what they should be incorporating in their offerings through their stores for upcoming seasons. Start by defining materials, which materials you're going to use to produce either footwear or accessories or apparel, and then you start by defining how you're going to turn those materials into fashion items. A report that we do that's called Home Shopper. It's a report where we look into a key item that's going to be relevant for the upcoming seasons, like the motorcycle jacket we see these similar items in different prices according to their retailers and according to their markets. An H&A could be offering a jacket in $50, and Sarah could be offering for $60, $70, and a Bloomingdale's might be offering for $200, $700. Well, the landscape of fashion now is fantastic for the consumer because you can look at the Paris collections and then before you've even put your newspaper down, you can probably go and buy some version of that in fast fashion at these incredible stores that are knocking this product out at, at approachable prices. Retailers like uh, H&M or Sara, I think they're a phenomenon in the industry. They change the rules in the industry. They help make, uh, as uh, we mentioned, they help democratize uh, fashion. What they bring is, is it's a trend, not necessarily a, a, a copy. They're translating these exciting new fashions that are coming every season and making it more affordable for them. Fast fashion is something that we cover a lot, um, and not just because they produce a lot of stuff and we're a daily, hourly, by the minute website. We have like 80 pieces of content that go up a day, and so you know, if we were only to cover designer, um, things we wouldn't have anything to talk about like most of the months of the year because it happens you know four times a year now I guess with pre-fall. It's fashion at its most accessible um, and nowadays I think that they're actually doing things that are maybe in some ways more interesting than what designers are doing because they're forced to produce at you know month by month benchmarks rather than you know seasonal benchmarks. I think that one thing that fast fashion has been really good at doing is convincing us that we live in something called a fashion democracy, which sounds like this really positive, progressive thing, that this is a huge le leap forward for mankind, that we're able to walk, walk into a store and buy whatever we want, whatever kind of style we want. What really blew my mind in the process of writing that book was going to southern China, where a lot of clothing is being manufactured, particularly cheap trendy women's clothing, so the things that we are buying in places like H&M or Forever 21, and just realizing the scale of the industry. Um, as Americans, all we see is the retail and design side of the industry. We don't see how this stuff is getting made, and we don't see the toll that it's taking. I'm an internet baby. I, I grew up blogging, which is such a weird concept. I, my first blog was on like Homestead and like Tripod or something. Um, so I've, I've, I've only grown up knowing the internet. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota and to find someone who, you know, shared that same enthusiasm for, for fashion was a little bit difficult. Um, nowadays, it's, it's just like, it's on, it's on your phone. It's on every single like tablet and screen that you have. It's on the internet. You, you can't even go 10 minutes without it. At least I can't go to the 10 minutes without it. It's like the most easy accessible thing, which is great because, you know, it's really encouraged this proliferation of lots of ideas. And, you know, it's, it's really sped along trends in a, a really breakneck pace. But at the same time, it's also made everything very similar in a lot of ways. Everyone knows what everyone else is doing and sometimes you see that convergence happening. The major change with internet is how fast it can be done. We're the first service that delivered all this information for trend forecasting uh, since 1992 online. If there's an emerging trend happening, we uh, notice the trend, we document the trend, and the, the report is ready next day. What we do for Instagram, even for Tumblr and Facebook, all these different mediums, we do specifically for how people engage someone who wants to comment, whether good or bad, on what you're putting out there, whether it's the image, whether it's an experience you had at the store, and, and we're on there. Like Our team is on there looking at the comments, responding, and I think it's really important because in an age where maybe someone isn't in a city where there is an actual opening ceremony store, this is kind of reaching our team here and the 
and really having a re reaction and a response. Because of the internet, because of e-commerce, because of social media, now anybody in Mexico, Argentina, South Africa, they can go on to Asianm.com, they can go on to Burberry, they can go to any website and they can see what's going on there. And social media, the internet, online shopping, um, a part of this vast, confusing landscape of fashion. And if you try to understand it all and make sense of it, you really are going to lose your mind. I think everyone now in fashion is a little trend skeptical. And when you open a magazine and it says fall trends and it says orange or something like that, you know what happened. You know that the, the, the fashion editor laid out 8 billion pictures of the fall collections and she saw an orange skirt and an orange bag. She saw orange. Trends definitely still exist. You have to have somewhere to start, especially when you go shopping or you're putting together a wardrobe, your, your wardrobe for the season or you're thinking about you know, what you want to wear during that day. Like I think trends are a good initial place to start if you're coming at it with zero. Um, it's a good way to categorize things. It's a good way to define a certain season and time. Um, and then, I mean, for me, it's a, it's a really great place to to just organize information, and then after you see the trends, you can think about, you know, what do they actually mean? Like trends absolutely exist. I think what's happening now is they move so fast that they seem to not exist. I think the fact that there's so much choice out there and the fact that so many trends exist at any one time does not mean that trends don't exist. It's just they're, they're moving so rapidly that they're kind of hard to pin down and talk about in any individual way.